Hey guys, so not just today, this week, kind of, maybe, um, we're going to be doing this story. This is only the first part and in the next couple of days we're going to be putting a couple of posts together and making bigger, longer videos. So subscribe, like, comment, all that good stuff and I'll see you at the end of the video. Alright, I'm not sure how interesting the story is but I'll go ahead and tell it. The core of the party in my longest running D&D is a necromancer. Now, one of the first things he did was obtain the Find Familiar spell. He may actually have started with that spell and just needed to get the 11 secret herbs and spices necessary to cast it. I don't remember. He tossed the herbs on the brazier, chanted the words of mystic power. The player rolled on the table and out trundled a small disgusting rat. He couldn't have been happier. The wizard named him Marty. It's Grand Wizard. <laughs> Now, going in, he didn't really know much about how to take care of rats, but he knew that they were supposed to like cheese, so he made a point to get a hold of cheese wherever he went and share it with his beloved Marty. This necromancer developed an interest in cooking in a rather roundabout way. You see, he had the autonomy proficiency, and in fact, he had the autonomous kit from the complete book of necromancers. In order to make a small amount of extra money, keep his skills sharp, and learn about the autonomies of different animals, he began working as a butcher from time to time. It also helped explain his need for blood-stained aprons and assortment of extremely sharp knives. It had the added benefit of giving him a way to dispose of excess monster body parts. That is, those he didn't preserve for future study and use. Well, before long, this necromancer had a bit of business going. But the truth was, although he greatly enjoyed the process of butchery, which wasn't really proper butchery the way he did it, it was more of a dissection, and using his herbalism and maybe a couple of other proficiencies, he later picked up the cooking proficiency and collected recipes from across the world in his adventures. He simply wasn't all that inspired by meat. Cheese, on the other hand, was a subject of great interest to him. He enjoyed it considerably, and over the years, he and Marty became accomplished cheese connoisseurs. They had sampled cheeses from all over the land, and they became very adept at judging them so much so that they could have worked as a professional cheesemonger in a large city had they been so inclined and had they not been so creepy and disgusting. In time, he learned to make cheese of his own. He invested some of the loot that he had acquired in his adventures in some sheep and goats and later some cattle as well. He is currently trying to acquire some buffalo and other even more exotic creatures and set up a cheese making operation. Now, being a necromancer, he had certain advantages that mundane cheesemakers do not. Undead are a rather poor choice of herders, but they can be used to protect herds from bandits and predators. And while a goat will not allow itself to be milked by a skeleton, skeletons able to perform many of the menial tasks of cheese production. Now, cheesemaking requires a large amount of milk, and if you want to do it well, a good deal of specialised equipment and unusual substances, rennet, acid and the like. As I indicated, he took care of these with the small fortune he had accumulated through his adventures. It also required a good deal of labour. This need he satisfied through a combination of employing locals and, quietly, providing his own corps of loyal workers. But he still needed a good place to age the cheese. Fortunately, he was able to come up with just the place. Early in his adventuring career, he had cleared out a number of caves, ruins and catacombs and had always meant to go back and make sure they had not become bandit dens or some such. Anyway, so it was that he set out about returning to the nearby dungeons he had cleared in the past and repurposing them for cheese production. He cleaned them, rebuilt when necessary, fortified them against potential attacks, populated them with undead servitors and proceeded to fill them with curds to age. So here we have a rather sinister, certainly deranged man constructing fortified, undead infested underground lairs, just as any villain would, but instead of doing so for the purpose of terrorising the countryside, worshipping dark god, or hatching fell schemes, he was trying to establish a higher standard of cheese for the region and provide quality snacks for his best friend, who was a rat. Alright, so he's got this cheese making operation. The thing about this necromancer though, is that he's not very patient. He's a hard worker and is willing to devote literally insane amounts of time and effort to really odd and kind of pointless things, but he doesn't like idly waiting. And the production of cheese, partially high quality hard cheese, requires a lot of waiting. However, 
He heard a rumour that the master cheesemakers of the halfling race possessed magics that would allow them to do it in weeks or months, what would ordinarily take years. These rumours were true. It's an actual magic item published in an obscure section of a moderately unpopular book that TSR actually put out. So it was that this master of the black arts set out for the great shire that was considered the homeland of the halfling culture to learn the secrets of the master halfling agriculturists and food artisans. Now, it turns out that rural halflings are disinclined to trust weird, overtly creepy tall folk wizards who carry around filthy, repulsive sewer rats, much less turn over their revered family recipes. Hard-won trade secrets and cherished magics to them. In time, though, through a combination of heroic good deeds, genuinely endearing, if often inept, kindness and good manners, and the gift of large quantities of quality pipeweed, he was able to win the friendships of the bulk of the halfling community and learn much of the secrets he sought and many others. Besides, what he could not win by friendship, he stole by guile or seized by force. Secretly, of course. Armed with this precious knowledge inscribed into his intermixed journals, sketches, notes and spell formula, he returned to his homeland and found that, after little profit in the first few years, since, as explained, it takes years for the quality cheeses to age. His business had developed a reputation for quality, largely on its own merits, but greatly accelerated by this necromancer's existing friendship with respected cheesemongers in the big cities of the setting, and was now turning a tidy profit. The magics he brought with him allowed him to greatly expand his operation, producing large quantities of relatively inexpensive but high quality cheeses that formed the bulk of his trade continuing the production of short ripening cheeses as usual, but completely eliminating the normal production of mid-term ripening cheeses in this dungeon. I've never said cheese so much <laughs> in my life. <laughs> Instead, using the halfling magic to produce them at a greatly accelerated rate, his cheese catacombs were reserved for the ripening of his premium line of cheeses. Now by this point, he'd reached a pretty high level and it was high time for him to build his stronghold. I figured he'd construct a wizard tower or some such in cheese country, but he had other ideas. For this next bit to make sense, there are a couple of other things you need to understand about this character. First of all, as an adjunct to his alchemical studies, which was yet another interest of his, he had naturally become acquainted with the technology of distillation. This eventually led him to develop skills at the more general art of brewing, simply so he could have another practical application for his knowledge making brandies and strong spirits and such. He had helped found a couple of small-scale breweries, wineries and distilleries. In fact, one of his dungeons was used to age liquor rather than ripen cheese. His products, the ones that had by then seen market, some he was still waiting on a lot of them, were of high quality, simply because he held them to the same high standards to which he held all of his endeavours, and were relatively well regarded, but had nowhere near the scale of production the cheese had. This changed somewhat when he put the brewers in contact with a tribe of orcs whose culture he and the party fighter had ruined, which is something I can tell you about if you wish. In an effort to improve the lot of this orc tribe, he gave them access to a number of resources, which included both hops and grapevines. Like I say, he put the brewers in contact with the folks he'd put in charge of this orc tribe's administration, which is something they now had, and promptly forgot all about it. The deal, that is. The Orc tribe was an ongoing pet project of his that required occasional supervision and tampering. The brewers, however, were quick to capitalise on the offer and had now, independent of the PCs, established a label that was quickly gaining popularity locally. The next thing you need to know is that the party had long-standing contacts in the spice trade. Some of their earlier jobs had been security on merchant caravans and their travels had taken them to distant lands where often spices and other foods were produced. Being PCs, they were always looking for ways to make money, and they quickly realised that spices often had very high value for their weight, could be easily separated into small amounts, and so sold off or given as gifts or bribes in small quantities if necessary, unlike jewels, and it had the obvious practical application of making food more palatable, particularly meat that gone a bit off. So they took to speculating on spices. This only became more true once bags of holding became involved. This behaviour was much more typical of the other party members than the necromancer, 
but it is nonetheless important. The last bit of background you need to know is that, as I believe I stated earlier, the necromancer made a point to learn as much as he could about the local cuisine, both common and, if possible, noble, whenever he went. So anyway, this necromancer comes back and restructures his cheese business and before too long, he's making good money. But that was never the goal. It wasn't enough to produce merely this cheese, he had to share it with the world. So he says he wanted to establish a base of operations. Now again, I figured he'd convert one of his forgotten tombs he'd recaptured into a base or build a tower like a normal wizard. Instead, he tells me he wants to open a high class tavern in the city. I asked him if he's sure and he replies that he is. The city is really the only place where he can be assured that there will be a proper audience for his cheeses. Once they catch on there, they can start selling them across the realm and beyond. That and the city is the one place that can provide a steady stream of bodies for his dissections and experiments without people getting too suspicious. The rogue chimes in that he wouldn't mind having another safe house in the city for his eventual thieves guild. More a band of spies and vigilantes actually. And it's settled. So the necromancer drops a huge amount of gold that he's been saving up on some prime real estate, makes some renovations and opens up his tavern. Now, this particular tavern was atypical in a few aspects. First of all, its focus was obviously cheese. Second, rather than being a place for travellers to stay that serves some drink and maybe some food, it was more like a modern restaurant slash caterer. It didn't have a full menu like a proper restaurant, but did have different offerings almost every day and specified dishes available by special order in advance. Obviously, a place with reputation for high quality, exotic and specialised provender will attract the wealthy, but since the necromancer wanted to make sure that common people could get a taste of Jesus, he divided the large common area into three main sections. The first offered basic, inexpensive fare, offered performers walk-in auditions and was open to anyone. The second required paid membership and was more private. The food offered here was more expensive and exotic and was of higher quality. It also offered more organised gambling options and booked only known professional performers. The third area was a feast hall that could be hired out for private parties and special occasions. When no such events were booked, it was either closed off or, on busy nights, opened up to expand one of either two areas. The other big difference between this tavern and others was that this one's cellar was staffed by desiccated skeletons and had a secret sub-basement that hosted weekly dissections of human bodies, attended by a cable of sinister men and women in dark robes. So there's that. So that's that. The Necromancer's Tavern was a huge success. He has since used it as the cornerstone of his whole business empire. It is an industry that spans the region with such diverse interests as farming, of grains, fruits, vegetables and meats, brewing and distilling. It offers food from across the known world and more recently beyond. It is intimately tied in with the ventures of the other party members, such as the rogues band of spies, information brokers, smugglers and doers of good deeds in the barbarians horse trading, smithing and mercenary concerns. It has in its time affected the lives fortune of men, halflings, orcs and most recently dwarves in a rather surprising fashion. It is an effort to bring the formerly unattainable to the common man. It's a front for a group of human ghouls whose society at large would find repulsive where they aware of them. Mostly though, it's about cheese. So what did you think of it? I really like the backstory to it. I can't wait to read more. Um, just to let you know, uh, the second channel, Thread Thrasher, is now Nerd Beardy. It's been given a kind of a wee revamp. So... Go over and check it out. I'll put links down below for everybody to have a look. Um, but this story will be running for the next couple of days. We might do a new one on Friday, like a different story on Friday. It just depends on how much we can put together in the one video. But um, check out the links for Discord, all the merch, and I'll see you in the next video. All those moments.